What's that? That is true. All right, have a seat. I've taken enough time. Brother Baker! Why Preach you... the word, brother. I've preach never, word. I've never had cross. to bring my own podium when I preached before. That was new. Hello, everybody. My name is Ryan Baker. Um, I used to know everybody. You guys have grown. I don't know anybody anymore. Some of you guys, like, I see you, and I kind of recognize you, but you've gotten several years older since last time we said hi. So, my name is Ryan Baker, sophomore at West Coast Baptist College. Adam's my brother. Savannah's my sister. So, if you don't know me, you unfortunately know them. So, anyway, it's good to be here. Why are you doing the Black and Gold Day on Monday? This is always a Friday thing. See, when I was in high school, like, if there was a snow day in Spirit Week, we missed it. It's like, oh, sorry, guys, you're done. You don't get that day. So, I'm glad they, they gave it to you anyway. But, um, Davenport with dyed his hair. Stand up. That looks really cool. So uh, that looks awesome. That's going all out. Sit back down. So when I was in Spirit Week, we had a, a dress like your dad day, and my dad has black hair. So I'm like, I'll just spray paint my head. That's what I did. And every single class I went into, they said, have you been sent to Mr. Kramer's office yet? Because that's, that's not allowed. I was like, oh, I'm just trying to show the school spirit here. But so he dyed his hair. I think that's awesome. That should be in the rule book. Totally okay. Love it. Uh, now, Spirit Week's a great week. Um, I always enjoyed going all out. One time, it was for mismatch day, I shaved both sides of my head, like, to baldness, because I wanted to go all out. And I got in trouble for that, too, because apparently you're not supposed to shave your head. Anyway, I had a good time. Spirit Week's one of my favorite times in high school. Uh, it's glad, glad to be here. Uh, glad to see you guys are having a good time with it. And you're really, like, excited for a Monday. Maybe it's the whole black and gold thing. Whatever it is, I, I love it a lot. Um, you know, I was thinking about, you know, coming to speak in chapel, super excited. I love chapel. Like, in high school, that was, like, the highlight of my day. It's like, okay, there's no, like, you do take notes, but it's not like you have to have a test over it later. You get to sit by your friends. It's just something different in the day. I love chapel. So as I was thinking about high school, I remembered one thing, like, that really stuck out. I don't miss it at all. <laughs> high school is not always fun. High school is hard. And up to this point in your lives, this is probably the hardest thing you've ever had to do in your whole life. Responsibility. How many of you guys have jobs? Anybody work? Thought so. Okay, how many of you have made money doing something? That can also constitute. Okay, almost all of you. That's hard. It is not easy to have a boss. And if you're, like, working for your family, because I've done that before, that's sometimes even more difficult. But being in high school, having papers trying to keep friends, trying to remember who's mad at who and who you're not supposed to talk to because the different cliques overlap. That's bad. High school is difficult, and y'all are mean to each other. Y'all are jerks. I don't miss high school at all. I do miss the youth ministry because Brother Kurt does the awesomest activities ever. But um, today I was just kind of thinking about what it was like to be in high school, but you guys are, you guys are doing great. I'm glad you're all super excited and stuff. Glad to be here. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. Um, we're going to learn about uh, the Apostle Paul. It's stories that you've heard before, but I was reading over it the other day, and I saw some stuff that I had I'd never seen before. Um, whenever I see something in the Bible that just, like, sticks out to me, I can't wait to tell everybody. And you're, like, the first people I'm able to tell this one to. So super excited to be here. Um, I was thinking about high school, and what for me was the hardest part was dealing with conflict. I didn't know how to deal with someone that didn't like me or is being a jerk. Like, I just, I just didn't know what to do with that. I was in eighth grade. Me and my buddy Matthew, some of you would know him. He graduated last year. Um, we were, like, together all the time. We always hung out. One day, it was Bible quiz, which, do they still do that? Is anybody in Bible quiz? They stopped it. No! That was my favorite. Bible quiz was awesome. We got to memorize a bunch of verses and get quizzed over them. There we go, Bible quiz. So we're sitting in class. I'm with all my friends. Jessica Hunter's older sister was there, Olivia. We were all crashing, hanging out. And I got up to throw something away, came back to my seat, and somebody took it. Somebody decided to switch seats and take mine. Like, I have a huge problem with that. There's a place at church here in this parking lot. I park every single time. Nobody can take my spot. I will show up early just to park there. When I'm sitting in class, I have that seat that I go to. In chapel, I have a seat. But this guy took it. Like, I, what in the world? What do you think? That is my seat. So I went over to him, and this guy was a bully. Bullies are not always older than you. Sometimes they're younger and just super annoying. That was this guy. He's sitting in my seat, and I said, hey, buddy, you're in my seat. Can you move over, please? And he didn't. He's like, no, you moved. I'm sitting here. I'm like, you, you can't do that. 
So I decided, since it's my seat anyway, I'm just going to sit down. And so I did, and I sat on top of him. Like, that's where I'm sitting, and if you're there or not, that's, that's where I'm going to sit. Well, he didn't like that. So he balls up his fist, and he begins. To, he was going to start beating on my back, which that's not good. I can't control myself. If you hit me first, you're just asking for it. So he went boom and just hit me on the back. And it, a reaction I just really couldn't control just came over me. As I was sitting in the seat, it was almost as if all the energy in the universe focused in on me and traveled straight to my fist. Because I whipped around and boom, nailed him right in the, the breather, the diaphragm, knocked out. <laughs> all the air out of the kid. He can't breathe, but I did, and this is bad, don't do this. Mr. Pearson was the principal at the time, and I got in a lot of trouble. Do not do that. But I hit him hard enough that it knocked him over in his chair, and he's on the ground and starts crying. Well, I was like, oh, I don't really know what to do now, but he deserved it. He was in my seat. Conflict is hard. I got in trouble from him, from my parents, from Mr. Pearson, from a whole lot of other people. It was not a good situation for me because I didn't deal with conflict correctly. High school, you're going to start dealing with that more and more. And as you know more people and as you're introduced to new situations, conflict is everywhere. So what are we supposed to do? You know, that guy, eventually I left high school and he was no longer something I even think about. But it seems like everywhere I go, whether I'm at work, I'm at college, I'm in the dorm room at college. It's almost as if he follows me because there's always conflict everywhere you go. You're never going to have a time in life where you're not bothered by somewhere or, or there's a perfect situation in everywhere. Even your parents sometimes can cause conflict in the home. So what do you do when conflict arises? Well, the Apostle Paul had three stories. They're all back to back and they're all the exact same. So let's look at how the Apostle Paul dealt with it, and so we can, uh, we can copy the same thing. First, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is an honor to be here. We get to open up your word, and we get to learn about what it says. Um, something I'm asking is for you to fill me with your spirit. God, would you put the words in my mouth that I need to know? Um, would you help these guys to listen? I ask that our hearts will be open to the reading of your words so that we can take it, we can change ourselves, and apply it in the future. God, please help us. In your name I pray. Amen. So, Acts chapter 13, um, here's what's happening. The church has pretty much exploded in growth. Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again, and everybody is going everywhere telling everybody else. Paul and Barnabas specifically are on this missionary journey. So they're, they're together, they say, all right, Barnabas, let's go. We're going to go to Antioch and Poseidon. So they travel, they're, they're walking, they're leaping, they're praising God. They get to Antioch and Bethsaida, and they start preaching. So they went to a synagogue, which would be very similar to what a church would be. And Acts chapter 13, verse 14, it says this. But when they departed from Persia, they came to Antioch and Bethsaida, and went into a synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Hold on just a second. Listen to how boring their services were. And after reading of the law, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the prophets... Those are all the prophets. Then the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Now, I could be completely mistaken, but I really don't think you can read all of those in one Sabbath day. If so, that is really impressive reading. But two, they needed someone to exhort, to cheer up, because that was so boring. Now, that may not be at all what it was, but when I'm thinking reading all the law and the prophets, that could be quite taxing. Like, there was no preacher or orator. It was just one guy reading. Like, that had to be pretty lame. So Paul gets up to exhort the people on the Sabbath day in the synagogue, and he rips face. He starts and doesn't stop. So in verse 16, then Paul stood up, and it goes all the way over to verse 43. He's still preaching. Paul got to tell these people about the good news, why he came, that Jesus, their Messiah, the person that they were just reading about in the Bible, he came to the world. He's going to take all your sins away. All you have to do is believe. So he told them all about this. And then the next verse, listen to this. The next Sabbath day came. Almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. The whole city. So here's a story about my college. We love soul winning. And if you don't like soul winning when you go, you learn to like it really quick because it's like the only thing we do. It's amazing. So on Saturdays, 
the whole campus, like even on a Saturday when most people like get to sleep in on Saturdays, like our campus is so like alive, people are running everywhere because we have soul winning to do and it's important. But my favorite time to go soul winning is once a semester, they cancel class all day long. They say sleep in, enjoy some rest, stay up late the night before, we don't care, but the next day there's no classes, we're all gonna go soul winning, which is sweet. I would go soul winning a thousand times more than I would want to go sit in a boring classroom. So we go off and we're knocking on doors and we're witnessing and we had a car of five people and we were just blitzing because it was like super early in the morning and nobody was awake on Saturday. So we're just leaving like uh, tracks in the door. We knocked 300 doors in an hour with us five guys. We sprinted from the moment we got out of the car through the entire neighborhood and got done in an hour and had 300 tracks passed out. It was awesome. Then we got to go out to eat at Chick-fil-A. It was a great day. But imagine if every single track that people got on their door, let's say a house is an average of five, 300 doors times five, that's 1,500 people. If all those people came to Lancaster Baptist Church, what we were soul winning for, we don't have room for them all to even sit down but then take all the other thousand college kids that were doing the same thing we were doing, we knocked over 50,000 doors in one day because classes were canceled. It was so much fun. But if everybody came that we invited, our campus wouldn't hold them. If we filled all of our buildings to capacity, if we had unlimited parking space, we could still only hold maybe 6,000 people. And our community is well over 200,000 people. So the whole city came together. Paul preached and he was exhorting, he was talking about what Jesus came to do and everybody that heard him the first Sabbath day told all their friends and they all came. The entire community came to the Sabbath and let's look what happened. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and they spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. So this is Paul introducing us to what conflict is. Now, there are four stages of conflict. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this quote down by Ryan Baker. You can just put a little dash and put my name after it because it's going to be famous. Conflict, if dealt with correctly, can bring closeness. Conflict is not always a bad thing, but when it's dealt with correctly, it can bring the people that were conflicting with each other closer together. And we're going to see that by the time we're done with this story. But the first stage in conflict is a, div a division in belief. So I have a dorm room of six guys. So imagine an oversized closet with three sets of bunk beds, and there's six dudes living in it. Like, tight, close quarters. It's, it's bad. One of my roommates is Matthew Dumpert, the guy who was with me in the beginning of my story. And Matthew is a very much opinionated guy. Most of you know him, and most of you already knew that. So... Matthew, I love the guy because he's so easy to make so mad. It's hilarious. I remember in his senior year, he did this huge um, science research paper on Germex versus hand soap. And he got a black light, and apparently whatever he did, super science stuff, made a backboard about it. Germex is bad for you. You're not supposed to use it. It doesn't kill any germs anyway. And he rants about it all the time, like in high school, but it had been a while since he had talked about it. And I was in the dorm room, and I said, guys, I discovered something amazing. I wake up in the morning, and I put on hand sanitizer, and I don't have to wash my hands for the rest of the day. I never use soap anymore because it kills 99% of all germs, so I'm only worrying about 1%. My life is good. Matthew was almost asleep. He was about to go to bed for the evening, and he goes, he just like sits up in bed, and his eyes are like bugging out of his face. He goes, you don't mean that, do you? Like, no, are you kidding me? That's all I use. I don't even touch soap. In fact, when I take a shower, I just use hand sanitizer. He goes, are you kidding me? That is so wrong. He had this huge opinion that hand sanitizer is bad. And I took the position that hand sanitizer is the only thing I'm ever going to use. Well, I got my roommate to agree with me. And I backed up, and I let them argue about it. And then I went off and took a shower, like a long shower. I shaved. I got my teeth brushed. I came back in the room like a half hour later, and they're still yelling at each other. It was hilarious. At the end of it all, Matthew was still like frothing at the mouth, like he was so angry. And he looks at me and goes, Ryan, you did that on purpose, didn't you? Yes, I did. I don't believe that at all. I just wanted to tick you off. 
See, when you have a divided belief, when two people take two opposite sides of what they think is true, conflict begins. And you can argue about it. You can yell and scream and spit and don't curse, but I mean, you can really get passionate about what you believe and the other person can do the same. But when conflict starts, that first stage is divided belief. And it's not always bad. You know it's not wrong for me to be talking with someone and say, you know what? I actually disagree with you. I don't agree. We have two very different opinions, and that's okay. There are friends, and Matthew usually, I'm not, usually don't try to provoke him to anger, but there are a lot of times where we have just great normal conversations, and we disagree, and it's okay. But when your division of belief, when you have two different things and you're clashing, it moves us on to a new stage of physical aggression. And that's what happened with Paul. Verse number uh, 48, it says, And the Gentiles heard this. Paul had just said the Gentiles can be saved, and that was the first time they'd, they'd ever heard that. So the Gentiles heard this. They were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But. You guys, that word can, contradicts everything that was just said. Like, for instance, I could say, Adam, you look great today, but I hate everything that you're wearing. See, like, that, that but just says, oh, there's this, but uh, never mind this. Paul just reached the entire region. But the Jews didn't like that because they were moved to envy a few verses before. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. Paul just hit a point in his life where he preached an excellent message. The whole city came together. And then he got kicked out for it. What kind of conflict is that? God, you sent me here to reach these people, and I got kicked out. I told them that you came, and they didn't believe me. This contradiction. They, they just they couldn't understand. They were envious. They were mad. They called me a blasphemer, and they kicked me out. Paul didn't understand why, and he didn't understand what the purpose was, but what he did understand was God was in control. It says this, but they shook off the dust of their feet against them, and they came into Iconium. They were done with Antioch and Poseidon. They tried. The Gentiles heard. Many were saved, but it didn't work out. See, when this conflict arose, there's division in belief, there's physical aggression, and there's a resolution. Okay, so let's say that you're all at the beach, because everybody loves going to vacation at the beach. You're swimming, and you forget that you're in the ocean for some reason. I've done this before. And I'm like, oh, it's a pool. And I open my eyes like what you can view in a pool. Not a good idea. For one, you can't see very far. And for two, you can't see very long. Salt does tend to get in the eyes, and it hurts awfully bad. And then if you're rubbing it out, and you've got sunscreen on your fingers, it just makes it worse. So I'm just like weeping, and I'm like an adult man. And I'm on the beach just crying, because I don't what to do. And so I'm grabbing Adam's shirt and I'm trying to wipe my eyes out and then I'm grabbing towels and I, nothing is helping. So I go all the way back to the hotel, I'll walk there and I just rinse my eyes out with fresh water. The only way to stop your agitation in the eyes is to completely get rid of it. And whenever you do that, that's what they had to do. So Paul was the salt in their eyes. And to resolve the conflict, they just kicked him out. There was no resolution. They just said, leave, we're tired of dealing with you. That, that doesn't really bring it to a close. And it will at the end of our story, so just wait. So the, third, the third part of conflict is a resolution. But let's look what happens in Iconium. Because when Paul got kicked out of Antioch, he comes to Iconium. Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 14. And it came to pass in Iconium that when they both together, Paul and Barnabas, went into a synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. It's the same thing that just happened. They go into a synagogue. People start coming. People start getting saved. Everything is awesome. And look at verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. That's just what happened in the last city. They got kicked out. They walked all the way to Iconium. They come to a synagogue 
And there were unbelieving Jews. Jews that did not believe. Paul is saying one thing. They didn't believe. What do we have? Division. They don't believe the same thing. That's step one. How did they handle it? Let's look at the next verse. It says this. Uh, actually, let's go to verse 5. And then, when, when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews, with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them. Okay. It didn't get resolved in the last place. They just got kicked out. This place, it just got worse. Not only were they going to kick them out, but they were going to kill them. They were going to throw and drop large and heavy stones on their head until they died. Okay, that's a little more serious than get kick, getting kicked out. Now, as Paul and Barnabas experienced this, the next verse says, They were aware of it, and they fled into Lystria and Derbes and cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. So Paul and Barnabas left. They didn't want to get stoned. I don't really blame them. That's not something I've ever tried. But I really don't think I would have enjoyed it too well. So they come to a place called Lystria. Um, verse number 8 is pretty sweet. So here's what happens. Um, the, the apostles come. And they're playing like world's coolest game of Simon Says. So let's imagine Paul's up there and he's talking. And he says, okay, pat your tummies. You're all out. Paul didn't say to do that. Okay, pat your heads. Okay, you're all out. But you in the back that have no legs that work, Simon says, jump. And the guy did. Like, he was crippled from the time he was born, and Simon P Paul said, jump, and he just jumps up and starts walking around. They have never seen anything like that. Like, that is intense. Okay, try me next. <laughs> Tell me to fly. You know, something really cool. Paul has all this power, and God, the Holy Spirit inside of him, lets him do all these cool things. So they start going, and they start healing people. Here's the people's response. They start grabbing cows to make sacrifices. Now, if you've ever read Leviticus, which is a pretty boring book, if I'm allowed to say that, like, it's a great book, and it's actually one of my favorites, but it can be hard to read. Cows are supposed to be sacrificed. They do it hundreds and thousands of times in the Old Testament, but... These guys grab cows and start leading them, and they're like, okay, we're going to sacrifice this. And Paul's like, great job. Y'all are getting it. They say, we sacrifice these two, Paul and Barnabas. And they're like, no, 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 that's bad. Don't do that. that you, you're close. You're really, really close, but not quite. Instead, let's sacrifice this to God because we didn't do that. So the, these people, are, they're getting it. They're getting discipled. They're seeing who God is. And turn, well, I have to turn the page. So look over at the next verse. Um, verse number 19. And there came thither certain Jews. From where? Antioch and Iconium. You guys know those names because those are the two places, one they got kicked out of, two almost stoned in, and those Jews that didn't let their conflict get resolved followed them. They were on the road and they came to Lystra, where Paul and Barnabas were. Let's see what they do. Who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul. So what is he doing? He's on a mission of God to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. And then he gets stoned for it. The people that he had been trying to reach, the people that he said, all you have to do is accept God, believe him and be saved, those people followed and they killed him. And it, Barnabas left, Barnabas got away, Paul wasn't so lucky, and they threw stones at him to the point where they knew he was dead. They grabbed him, they pulled him outside of the city, and left him. So God did save him. Because it says in verse 20, how be it, the disciples stood round about him. He rose up. And he came into the city. He was just stoned there. You're not supposed to go back. If you get stoned or it gets shot or killed or something, you don't usually go back to the people that did that to you. Paul, uh, he may have had to be carried in. Stones will break your bones. Like, that will hurt you. You won't be able to walk if enough of those break your legs. So Paul walked or was carried into the city, felt a lot better, ate some soup and got healthy again, and he said, now I'm going to go back out because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Watch how he handled this. This is the entire message summed up in one verse. Look at verse 21. And when he had preached the gospel to that city, 
and taught many. He re- returned again to Lystra. And he returned to Iconium and to Antioch. The final step in resolving conflict is how you go back. Paul gave everything. His life, his breath, his being. He tried to reach these people. And everything he did just was so under par. He just wasn't getting it through to the point where he had to. The Bible principle of turning the other cheek. He let them stone him, but he went back. When somebody wrongs you, when somebody takes your chair in class, When they wrong you, how you respond, how you come back, and how you love them after they've wronged you is determining the type of conflict that we as Christians get to experience. When you're in class, when you're with your teachers, your family, your friends, 20 years from now, you're going to be experiencing conflict, and it's going to hurt. People are going to despitefully use you. They're going to hate you. They're going to to treat you so badly that you're not going to even know how to respond, but how come back is how God uses you to reach those people. Paul says, confirming the souls. The people that were saved got discipled. Verse 23, he says, and when he had ordained them elders, and get this, every church, he had prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. They went through all their cities into every church. They ordained council members and elders, and they got the church set up with pastors and preachers. They got the church ready, but that never would have happened if he wasn't able to go back. Here's how it applies to us. When we're wronged, when we have a different belief, the very beginnings of conflict, if and sometimes when, when it goes to a physical aggression, when they're just being mean or if they push you, or if they start tearing you down with their words, when it comes to being physical, They're just going to want to get rid of you. Let them. Let them solve their anger in whatever way they really have to. But when you come back, when you meet them next, here's how you could say, Ugh, you were a jerk to me. I'm not talking to you. Or you can return like Paul did. With a heart of love, with a compassion for others, Paul went to the people that wronged him and loved them back. Here's two ways to do that. The last two, I'm almost done, so just bear with me for these last two things. For one, I'm going to call it the possum principle. You guys ever seen a possum on the side of the road? I always want to, like, run over it just to make sure it's not playing dead because I know they do that. Like, I want to make sure that thing is actually dead. Whenever they feel like they're in danger, when there's a predator on the loose, their first response is run away. If that doesn't work or if they're getting too close, they just drop over, stick their tongue out, and just play dead. As... Sometimes fun as that might sound, it's not always easy. The same thing as turning the other cheek is rolling over, playing dead, and letting those people just unleash their conflict. And sometimes that means being wronged. If someone calls you a liar and you didn't lie, sometimes it's easiest to just say, okay, I'm not going to argue with you. You can be mad. Do you realize it's every single person's right to be angry? It's not biblical, but they can do that. And the easiest things at times to do is to just let them be angry. Let's think about a story in the Bible, Jacob and Esau. One brother is like, hey, I'll give you a pot of soup for your birthright. Oh, I'm really hungry. Okay. And then later he dresses up like a sheep and somehow that passes as a brother and he gets his his blessing as well. That's awesome. But they were ticked. And as physical aggression, Esau tried to kill his whole family. He tried to kill Jacob. They ran away and for years they were gone. And Jacob came back later. Remember, he wrestled with an angel. The guy touched his hip, and then he had to limp over the little lake, whatever. He met his brother. His brother came up with a caravan army, runs up to his brother, and gives him a big old hug and says, it's okay. That's turning the other cheek. Someone that was wronged saying, I choose to love you anyway. So there's a possum principle. Just playing dead, allowing yourself to be wronged. And two, there's the yes, sir principle. Now, this is more of if you're dealing with a a higher power, so say teacher, mother, father, and the older we get, even God. Do you realize that Jesus was one with God, and I'm not going to overthrow any doctrine here, but he and God 
had an instance where they didn't necessarily agree. Let's think about it. Jesus was praying in a garden, and he says, Lord, if there is a way that you can take the sins of the world, you can purify them, cleanse them, sacrifice for them in some way, and take them to heaven, great! But if not, not my will, but thine be done. Meaning Jesus had a will. Jesus had something that he wanted. He wanted us to be saved without having to suffer. But thine be done. This is the yes, sir, the submission to those above you. When it's not easy. How many of you have been spanked for something that wasn't actually your fault? Adam, that happened because of you. Anybody? Has that ever happened? Because I did once, and it was terrible. I did not deserve that. But it does happen because people make mistakes. And when we can have a situation and say, yes, sir, God's pleased. It resolves the conflict, and we're doing what Jesus did. Because when conflict comes, there are ways to deal with it in a perfect way. And it doesn't mean punching the kid that takes your seat. But resolving situations like Jesus did. Saying yes, sir, and submitting when it's not easy. Or letting someone abuse you and just let it be okay. It's not the end of the world to appease someone conflict so you can come back and minister to them and help them in a time of need. Because that's what the Bible teaches. Um, if I could have one thing to tell you, it would have been this. This is the one thing in high school that nobody preached the message on, and I wish they would have. It would have saved me demerits. This is important because if we can get this principle down, we're going to be set up for the rest of our life. If I could ask Brother Kurt, Brother Mendenhall, Miss Herding, does conflict ever stop? Guarantee you they're going to say no. And if we can learn right here at Franklin Road Christian School how to deal with conflict, it's going to bless us the rest of our lives. Apply these principles. I hope you took some notes because this is something some of you are going to deal with today. And so as conflict arises, look at the Bible for what it says. Because when we can take the Bible and we can apply it, God gets glorified. Let's pray. You guys listened really well. Dear Heavenly Father, it is an honor to be here. These guys listen so intently, and I thank you for it. Thank you for your principle in the Bible uh, about how to, how to resolve conflict, how to deal with it, and thank you for the example of what you did. And God, I pray that as we live our lives and as we go through our day, I ask that we can find opportunities and situations where we can do what you did and say yes, sir, to conflict, even when it's not easy. God, to do this, we have to be spirit-filled, and I ask that you'll do that. I ask that you get rid of all of our pride and so we can be humble. God, I ask that we can live like you did. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Ryan, thank you. What a blessing. Hey, listen, you're going to face that con conflict today. Be a possum or a yes. I love those two thoughts. Just be dead. Paul said, I die daily. What a great message. And uh, you will face the conflict. Some of you faced it this morning before.